So today we're, today we're going to talk about the way we uh, deploy code at iRobot, specifically on our cloud side. So it's kind of broken up into two main parts. There's the code that we deploy to the robots, which goes through a more traditional release process because we're doing over-the-air updates and deploying this code out to millions of robots out in people's homes. Uh, so there's uh, the risk calculation is a little bit different. Uh, if you make a mistake doing that, it's very expensive to fix. Uh, whereas when you deploy stuff to the cloud, which uh, to this group I probably don't have to uh, preach the benefits of the cloud and some of the safety that you get. You can easily roll back a change or worst case like nuke your EC2 instance and start over again. It's really hard to do that with a Roomba. Uh, you have to actually build a new one. Um, so today I'm gonna cover the way we deliver code for our cloud side applications, which we're slowly moving our um, robot applications to roughly the same process. And we're gonna create a CI CD pipeline that's gonna look very similar to this. Um, and then I'll, we'll also create like a sample app, um, which could like notionally represent whatever app it is that you're building or that you're um, responsible for inside your own company. Um, that it'll be a, a trivial toy app. It's just like something that we can deploy through this pipeline. The real meat of this presentation is the actual pipeline itself. Um, so the contents of this presentation are on GitHub. Um, and probably nobody can read that. So let me make this bigger. Of course, it didn't make the, um, the URL any bigger. So that was useless. Let me try to. <laughs> All right, is, is that easier to read? So it's just GitHub, RH Boyd, and then DevOps Days Boston with the appropriate capitalization. I'm not sure if GitHub's case sensitive or not. So I'll give everybody a minute to jot that down. Or, and everything we go over today is also on the GitHub. Um, and there's some stuff that I'm also gonna go over today that isn't on there yet. It's just because I haven't pushed the commit with an updated readme to it, but it will be up there tonight. Uh, it's just like slightly more advanced topics um, if we get get to them. Either way, they're going to be up there, it's just whether or not we get to them today. So let me clear that out. Um, so when we go through today's demo, everything I do in this blue window will be our like notional application um, because it will, these are, you deploy your infrastructure and you deploy your application separately from one another. There are some people who think that you could do that together. You keep all your pipe, your templates in the same file, in the same folder structure, um, and then just like a mono repo almost for infrastructure and application. People, some people have use cases that necessitate that. I personally don't prefer it, um, but you know it's whatever works for your team. And then this light pink window will be our pipeline. This is what we'll be doing most of our work today and most of the interesting work. Um, and switching back and forth with like the GitHub doc as we walk through that. Um, let's see. And then the application that we're actually deploying just looks like this. It's just API gateway and a Lambda function. Uh, yours, I hope, or could be like possibly much more sophisticated, many Lambda functions, many APIs. Uh, how you scope your microservice is you know, up to you and the architects on your team. But for the, the almost everything we go over today, it'll apply to this application that we have here, the same way it would have applied to a much more complicated application. Um, and I believe that is most of the introductory material. So some prerequisites to, to do this. now. The theater format for this is like kind of difficult. If someone gets stuck, I can't like come to your seat and help you get unstuck because I'd have to climb over a bunch of people, which is funny the first time, not funny the second time. Uh, so what I was planning on doing today is just like what, going through this tutorial and if people are brave enough to, try to, to keep up with it, I'm not gonna go incredibly fast and I'll be explaining everything that I do. Um, but if you wanna try and keep up, you can. If you fall behind, I'll stick around for a little bit after the the workshop to help people one on one if they get stuck on something or to talk more about it. Um, but all the material is here that you could uh, go back to you know, your hotel or back to your home or your office and, and do this yourself if you wanted to. And I know it's the last session on the last day, so a lot of people want to get out of here quickly. Um, but I'm not going to you know, rip you off and not give you the full experience. So some of the prerequisites you need an AWS account. We're using all AWS tools, but a lot of the concepts I discuss can be used on any cloud provider. Um, it's you know, source control controlled deployments, uh, gradual release, things like that. Most of the major cloud providers have something similar that you, know, you just have to find out what their specific proper noun is for uh, that particular feature if they offer it. So since we're using AWS, we're gonna use an IAM user. Uh, inside a corporation, you may use like some kind of a SAML provider or some kind of a identity provider that provides you as a developer with the IAM role to use and then you would get credentials that way. For a demo purpose, it's easier for me to just use an IAM user with Git credentials. Um, we're gonna do this 
thing in Python 3, so it's just the um, sample application we're creating is the, uh, uh, the serverless application model application, and it's one I just wrote in Python. You can write it in Node or any other application, or any other language that's supported, it's just a notional application. You'll also need the SAM CLI, which depends on Python uh, 3, I believe. I know it depends on Python, I'm just not sure on the version. Um, it's fairly easy to install. Uh, the documentation is pretty good and it's getting a little bit easier. Um, and then for testing the API in our application, Postman is, is a nice tool to use, but you could use curl or some other application if you didn't want to use Postman. Um, so I'm just going to make sure I have this set up correctly. All right, so you can run SAM version just to make sure we have a version of SAM. That's great. Python version, make sure we have Python. That's not good. Better, right? Uh, it's, so Mac's talking, or Apple's talking about they're not going to include Python anymore by default, which is great because then I don't have to worry about this Python 2, Python 3 problem. Yeah. And I can just use Python 2, 3. Because if you try to uninstall Python 2, like everything breaks. Uh, that was a tangent, I shouldn't have done that. So what we're going to cover today is code commit, code build, code pipeline, code deploy, and cloud formation. Uh, I used to refer to like this set of tools as like the code star suite, the same way you would use like kind of like a regex, but then Amazon launched a service called code star, uh, which it does what you would think it would do. It covers all of these and builds you like a nice like hello world application, but then I, you know, it made me have to use a new word. So this is generally referred to as the code suite, um, which includes code star. Um, and then CloudFormation is how we deploy our actual application. Because we're using AWS's serverless application model, which uses CloudFormation to do the infrastructure as code, uh, we will use that for uh, managing our pipeline infrastructure and for managing our uh, application infrastructure as well. And then this is outdated. There's no DynamoDB. Uh, when I first started putting together this workshop, I was like, I'm gonna have this crazy application. It's gonna be um, all kinds of like, you know, direct service integrations, it's be all this stuff, and then I realized like nobody cares about that, they actually just care about the, the pipeline, that's why you're here today. Um, so it's just API Gateway and Lambda, and like I said, it, it's a placeholder for whatever your application is. Um, so we're gonna create two folders, um, and the reason I'm using two separate windows is because there are, logically there's two separate things we're doing. We're creating the pipeline and our infrastructure, and we're creating our application uh, that will be deployed through that infrastructure. So it makes it easier with like the color difference. I'm gonna do these in two separate folders inside there just to kind of make it a little bit easier. And of course, no one can read it, but this says application at the top. Um, so the blue one is our application and the pink one is our pipeline. So P for pink and pipeline should help. Um, so we will start by making a folder to just kind of hold this stuff. So we're gonna make their pipeline folder. Probably shouldn't be trying to live code. I should just record all of this and then we'll CD into there. Okay. And then oh, I lost my mouse. Sorry. Uh, make der, what are we going to name our application folder? We're going to call it like my DevOps days app. Um, and just real quick, uh, you'll see that we have these two the pipeline folder I created in the other window and this one. So we're about to CD into here. So they're both. So we have these set up, and then we need to create an empty pipe, an empty YAML file for the cloud formation. So we'll say touch pipeline YAML, and I'm just gonna paste this in here. Uh, and it's not a good workshop if I just like uh, actually sorry Vim pipeline not there. I shouldn't be using Vim, but. So if I just paste this in here and said, okay, we're done, like that wouldn't be a very good workshop, so I'm gonna go over this real quick. Uh, for anyone who hasn't used CloudFormation before, the top line is optional. Oh, it scrolled up. Um, it just says the, it's a template format version. It is optional, but if you do supply it, you have to supply this, this string that says like the version, and that's the only value that it accepts, so it makes no sense to me, but that's the spec. Uh, a description is just like a, a description for it, so it's easier if you're looking through the file, you know kind of what they meant to, to do with this. Parameters are things that you can pass into your template. So when you go to deploy your CloudFormation template, you can pass in parameters that change its behavior. So if you want to parameterize your, um, you know, maybe you deploy applications for other teams, uh, and the only real difference is maybe like the, the, the Lambda, AWS Lambda runtime you use. So you could pass in a thing for um, you know, Java or Python or Go or Node.js, and then you could like switch on that. 
We won't be doing anything like that in this workshop, but this is just an example of a parameter. Because we're giving it a default value, it's then not required because we'll just pick up the default value. And this is where we get into the fun stuff. The resources is where like all of the, the fun happens. This is a code commit repository. So code commit is AWS's managed Git service. So you can interact with it with a regular Git client to you know, run your favorite commands like git commit, git push, git push force, right? Just git merge force, force um, so that you don't have to do code reviews and things like that. And then we're referencing the project name, so we're just gonna name the repository after the, the project, just to keep it simple. Uh, let me escape out of this. And now I'm going to deploy just the stack by itself, just to, sh just to make sure that everything kind of works. Um, and then we'll like slowly add features to this. Um, I should probably, before I do that, go back to my description here and talk about what we're actually building. So what we'll do is we'll check in our code to code commit, which is like a managed git service. And when the code's checked in, that will trigger an event that causes code pipeline to pick up that new commit. And then it will pass that, uh, that commit off to code build, which is a, uh, managed build service that uses a Docker container and it will build the application for you. And this is where you can do things that you typically use in something like a Jenkins server, uh, but it's completely managed for you. So you don't have to worry about um, you know, patching it or updating the version of Jenkins. You just supply a, uh, a Docker image that says, you know, these are the, the steps I wanna run. You can use different base images. Amazon has a lot of prepackaged ones for you that you can use that have many of your uh, you know, favorite dependencies. So if you're building a, a Lambda Building a Lambda application based on Python, you can pick like the Python version of this and it will come with Python and pip and all of your favorite Python dependencies. Likewise with Java and Node.js and Go and things like that. Once that build is successful, assuming that it's successful, I've had many unsuccessful builds in my time, uh, it will pass them on to another stage in the pipeline which, is, which uses CloudFormation to actually deploy the code. So for the first part of the, the workshop, we will only be using the CloudFormation, and then later we'll add um, code deploy to show like how you'd be a bit more sophisticated in the deployment. But just this rectangle in here is what we'll start with. Right, so we're gonna do, I'm gonna cheat a little bit. And uh, it's not in here. All right, I'm gonna try to wing it. So I, I never remember these commands, so let's try it. AWS CloudFormation deploy. We gotta, so we're deploy, we're using the AWS CLI, we're gonna use CloudFormation as the service we wanna use, we wanna deploy. Template is dot slash pipeline. Uh, profile, uh, I forgot what, it, what my profile was. DevOps demo, let's see if that works. Um, I have to disconnect the HDMI for just a moment because I have to look at my password file and I don't want all of you to see it. There you go. I mean, that was what Cool, um, I messed it up. Uh, invalid subcommand. Did I misspell something else? It's okay. Um, if you're having this problem, what you can do is just copy and paste this. Oh, I didn't give it a stack name, but that doesn't explain why none of the rest of the stuff worked. Try this again. Okay, so quickly what this saying, CloudFormation deploy, we have to give it a template, which is a pipeline we just created. You have to name the stack, so when it's deployed to CloudFormation, you have to give it some kind of a name so it knows how to track it. And then I'm using, oh, I took that off. I'm using profiles to uh, control what like credentials it gets, so it knows like which account to put it in and what user to use, IM role to use to do that. Um, just because I have many accounts in my AWS organization that I use personally, that's easier to manage. But if you're just doing like a one-off thing, like an IM user, it's sufficient. And now we wait. It should go fairly quickly. It'll take like three minutes or so. It hasn't thrown an error yet, which usually means I'm on the right track. So while that's doing that, I will log into the account. Oh, it moved. Yep, waiting. So it, it'll create a change set. Um, and this is just like some CloudFormation basics. It will create a change set and say, okay, here are like the new things that will be created if I execute this, um, this change set. And because of the way the command line, I, I told it to just do a deploy. Um, there's ways of saying create change set and then deploy change set if you wanted to break those up, which we'll see later in the pipeline. 
um, and it will then uh, apply that change set to actually create the, the, the new resources for you. So by splitting that up into two steps, you can have like a manual intervention process. If you wanted to say, you know, anyone can push to mainline, their code will go out, it'll get built, but it'll create a change set and it'll say, okay, here's the diff. And then someone has to manually say like, yep, that's appropriate. And they click yes. And then it continues on from there. We're not going to do that in the workshop today, but I'll show you where you would insert something like that. Failed. That's not good. So one trick I usually do is I just say like, just give it a different name. Sometimes there's a name collision. We'll see what happened. Oh no, this should. Oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. I probably shouldn't have been on like the attendee wireless because it seems slower. Maybe I'm sharing it with all the rest of you. Beautiful. What's this saying? Failed again. Uh -oh. Let's go into CloudFormation, bless you. Uh, CloudFormation, being this zoomed in makes this a bit hard, but we'll see why it failed. Oh, I need to switch to DevOps demo. It says my account number. I don't think there's any security implications with anyone seeing my account number, but don't hack me, please. Uh, and this is like the fun of like CloudFormation templates is that, um, go back and read. I'm gonna make this smaller just for a second so I can read it and then I'll make it bigger once I figure out what. Oh, that's right, okay. Oh, that's too small. So what happened was I was testing it this morning, re rehearsing my uh, talk and I already made one that like worked. Um, and when I tried to make a new one, there was a name collision because I manually named that uh, code commit repository. So in general, for resources, you don't want to manually name them because you get run into issues like this. So if you try to deploy something several times, you're intending to create several different resources, but they have the same name and they collide and then everything's broken. Uh, code commit's slightly different because the, the name is the only field that's required, um, which is why it throws me off. Um, let me just delete these. I'll probably get throttled for deleting stuff too fast. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna change the name of the repo just so we can, we don't have to wait for that delete to finish. Uh, it works, I'll totally jinx this. And then give it a, Fingers crossed it works this time. It's usually why I do this um, very early in the process to work out some of these like smaller kinks in the, the workflow when there's like very few resources going on uh, being created because CloudFormation is notoriously like slow to create some resources and then you do this for like an hour and then it notices an error and then it takes another hour to roll all those back and it can really like mess up your development cycle. Oh, success. All right, so we're on the right track. This is great, right? Like this is, only took us what? like a half an hour to, to add a repo, which is like three clicks in the console. <laughs> I don't have to tell all of you about like the benefits of infrastructure as code and like why we're doing this even though it's slower, but like this is what your manager sees, right? It's like, why did it take you, uh, you know, all afternoon to create a repo? And it's like, no, you don't understand the names. The names aren't right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I get it, right? If your manager yells at you, tell him to come yell at me or her, tell her. Um, cool, so now we'll, um, We'll add a bucket to this, an S3 bucket. A lot of people have heard of S3 buckets, but um, the reason we're using an S3 bucket is um, we're gonna kind of like put some some of our artifacts from the build process into there. There is a bucket that Code Pipeline will create for you for storing like pipeline specific artifacts. Um, I prefer like creating a separate one because it gives me more control over like the access control to the bucket, um, and then I just don't use the automatically generated one. Um, and I'm gonna stop using Vim to edit this thing because I hate Vim. Um, and not that I hate Vim, it's just like hard to do and I'm not good at it, so it's like makes it even harder. So I'm gonna open folder. Which one? Oh, 24 seconds. Pipeline folder. And then hopefully this will be a bit easier to see. Oh, go away. Uh, people are already leaving me. I see how it is. <laughs> no. no, I'm just kidding. If you want to leave, you can leave. I won't hold it against you for too long. 
right? So we have the bucket. Uh, so this is, uh, I probably should introduce this with CloudFormation. It's YAML, if anyone hasn't worked with it before. It's, um, uh, it's, it's like a better version of JSON, but it's still like only, it's a low bar to cross. Um, and like Python, it's like uh, uh, sensitive to white space. So like these two things are next to each other, so they're like pure objects. If you had done something like this, it would like lose its mind. It's like, I don't know what's going on here. White space is hard. Um, all right, so I made like a small change, and I just rerun the same command. It'll deploy the bucket. Hopefully, this will work. It should work. There should, should be a reason why it wouldn't work. So while it's deploying, it should only take a minute. Does anyone have any questions about like anything that I've said that's unclear? Or I've been speaking too fast. I know that we probably have people from like wildly different experience with AWS technology. So there's some of the stuff that people don't aren't familiar with or are. Okay, cool. If you have questions, feel free to come talk to me afterwards if you're shy. Um, I'll only make fun of you a little bit. Right, so we have the bucket. This is going to hold our resources. The, the, during the build process, we're going to stick them in there when we're done so that we can then you know, kind of pass it around. This is common when you do like a multi-account setup where you're building and doing your deployments and managing that from a central account, and you're deploying your resources out to other accounts. You might have a, a, you know, a dev account, an integration account, a production account for the US, a production account for Europe, a production account for South America. Um, whatever your like account structure is, it, if you're using a multi-account structure in AWS, which is the preferred uh, way of or architecting these things, having like a separate distinct bucket for these artifacts instead of using the default one, I found works best for me. Because then I can control what KMS key is applied to it. I can control um, like the individual policies on this. I can hook up lambdas to it, which I think you can do with the other one, but you have to wait till after the code pipeline creates it, and then it's very closely tied to the code pipeline, which I don't really don't really like. Yes, you had a question. What? Yeah, I hate naming buckets. I hate naming anything. Like uh, as you saw, I struggled to name even the folders that I was using. Uh, I'm just not a very creative person. Uh, there's some problems with create with when you manually name something with CloudFormation. If you ever make a change to it that requires replacement, that change will fail because what it does is it first creates the new item. And then once that's successfully done, it does the stack cleanup operation where it deletes the old ones. But since bucket names have to be globally unique, um, you couldn't make another bucket if you had manually named it. You have to rename it, which essentially just destroys the resource anyways. Um, so if I can get away with it, which is why I messed up on the code commit repository, I don't name things manually unless there's like a really good reason to. And you had a question? Oh, and his question was, why didn't I name the bucket Specifically, it's one of the few properties that most people give to a bucket, but you only really need the one. But that was why I didn't manually name it. You knew a question? Sure. We could probably fill, oh, is it, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No. Um, so her, her question was, um, is there a, a rule of thumb to use if you're deploying many applications across many stacks using various technologies? Some people might be using like a simple like LAMP stack. Some people might be having like a single page app that's like React with an API gateway in the background. We could probably have like a deploy days Boston. We'd spend three days like arguing about different ways of doing that. Um, I think that the people who own the individual services would decide like what deployment strategy works best for them. Um, I try to like, we do microservices at iRobot and I try to, um, the things that we build, we deploy as like a bounded context. So everything that like makes sense to change together, we put together into like its own pipeline. Um, you tend to have problems when you have like people who've built like monoliths their entire career and then they say, okay, now you're mi making microservices and they make like a monolith out of microservices. Um, and then they try and deploy all of it at the same time, and then it, it fails. Um, I would, it's a usually a good sign in a organization to be able, if, you, if one service could deploy by itself without affecting a bunch of other services, it means that you've done a very good job of like decoupling that, which by itself doesn't necessarily mean that it's, a, it's architected very well, but it's like a good sign. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, and I'll talk more about deployments later too, as we get into it. Um, so I'm going to move forward. Let's just make sure that, cool, so that worked. Uh, I'm not going to switch back and forth and like verify that it actually deployed each time uh, because 
hopefully you can trust me and I will only lie to you a little bit. Um, so the next step is the, the fairly boring part. Um, so we, we need to create a role for code build to use. So we're gonna use code build um, to build our application, which will run things like SAM build, or it'll fetch some dependencies and kind of bundle everything up and get it ready for deployment. This is also when you would run like your, your some of your integration tests or some of your unit tests. Um, well, definitely some of your unit tests, maybe some of your integration tests, because this guarantees that like the tests are actually run. If you allow people to just push code straight into like some bundled artifact, like straight into some repository that'll be deployed, uh, you just kind of have to take it at the developer's word that they actually ran the test. This way, the only way it gets in there is if it goes to this build step, which has the, the test in it. In order to do that, we need a role, which is what AWS uses for like controlling access to various resources. Um, and we're just saying allow code build to assume this role. Um, so for this resource, it doesn't do anything except it, it gives it a very specific name, which I just said I don't like doing. But this is an artifact of, if you're doing like a multi-account structure, you need, it creates a secular dependency between your central build account and all of your other accounts because, uh, well, code build role is not necessarily that way, um, but some of the other roles we use, and I just wanted to be consistent, that um, your, the pipeline, code pipeline role needs permission to um, do things in other accounts to deploy resources to those other accounts, um, and the other accounts need to be able to like trust the pipeline role. Um, so if, you know, you don't explicitly name the role. Neither one of them knows like what the other one's doing. Like it, it's, it, you create a secular dependency where one depends on the other, which depends on the other. So manually naming them like breaks that, um, even though I hate doing it. It's, it's the only option for now. Are you stretching or you had a question? Okay. Sorry, yeah, I mean, when I start talking about like IAM roles and policies, people tend to get a little tired. Um, so I won't hold it against you. I mean, I think it's fun, but it's like fun in a way that like not being able to solve a Rubik's Cube is fun sometimes. Uh, and then this is like the actual policy. So this says what the, uh, what the role can actually do. Um, it can get and put files from S3, because um, that's where it's going to be putting the, um, the built artifacts. And then uh, yeah, in the bucket that we created earlier, um, further up in the document. Uh, some of this is just like the reference syntax. There's other ways of representing this, which are a little bit cleaner, but I just copied it from our production code. And then there's some just, uh, logging information that we like code build to be able to you know, log this so we can keep an eye on like how long builds are taking or um, uh, what is another one? Uh, logging build failures and like trying to figure out like root cause stuff uh, for like automated like oh this person's commit broke it so then we can like send them an angry email. We'll wait till we know that they've left for the day and then send them an angry email so they come back. I don't actually do that, I'm just kidding. And then we just say okay this policy is now attached to that role. So I'm gonna copy all of this Oh, no, that, okay, when I said all of this, I didn't mean <laughs> the story of my life. I try to be like clever and then I shoot my foot off. Cool. It's in the resource block. Um, so anything in here that's like indented at all, it means it's inside like the resource block. There's a couple that I'll add later that are in like a different resource block. Um, are you following along on the GitHub page? Um, so underneath each one of the, um, the code things, it says this, te this complete template can be found here. So I'm just adding like the diff in each one of these documents on the GitHub um, just to save space. Uh, but if you go to this, in this folder, we'll go back real quick. Oh, no, that's not it. I hope I committed it. Oh my God, I, I did not commit that, I'm sorry. Um, it will be up there as soon as I'm off stage. Um, crap, what am I doing? Yeah, because I put them all in the folder, my local working copy, and I forgot to push it. I, I committed it, I just forgot to push it. Um, so there'll be like the, the full template will be in there. Um, I'll tell you specifically when we're doing something outside the resource block. For, so for the rest of the demo of the workshop, um, everything will be in the workshop, in the inside the resources block of the template. Uh, back to where we were. I think I just pasted this. Yes. Uh, we will deploy that. And then we'll go back to talking. So now we have a role for the code build project to use, but we need an actual code build project to actually build stuff. And this is where you would define that. So you give it a name. I give 
I give them manually name the things here because we use a centralized build account and I want to know which builds go with which teams. Um, and just naming them based after like the service that it's on like helps us with that traceability. Um, I think you could not name it and it'll pick a name for you, but it wasn't very friendly. I think it was the reason we, we chose to name them. Uh, and then you, know, you tell what role to use, which is this role we just defined. Uh, this artifacts type says like how this will be invoked. So once we get there uh, in like the next section or so, we'll have code pipeline is what will actually invoke this code build to like tell it to run. There's other ways of having code build start. So you could have like a Lambda function, which um, is what people do if you do uh, like feature branch based uh, uh, development where everything that's on mainline or master or whatever you call your main trunk uh, will always be built and then deployed. Uh, but people need to be able to commit to feature branches and you still want to do builds on that. So one example that people tend to do is that they will say, anytime someone commits to any branch, no matter what it is, it will um, trigger this Lambda function. And if it's, a, if it's on master or mainline, it won't do anything because we know the pipeline will take care of it. If it's on any other branch, the Lambda function tells code build to like build this and then send the, um, uh, the artifacts and like the output of the build process to whatever developer committed that as like a, a build report to say like, you know, this last commit wouldn't build had you committed to mainline, it would be broken. Uh, and then this is where we define the environment. Um, so it's just a, a container. It's a container-based build system. We're using like the pre, oh, sorry, the pre-built image because it has most of the stuff that we need, specifically Python 3.7. Um, it does support, especially with this 2.0, like polyglot builds. So if you've ever used the AWS CDK, it is it, is, it needs Node to work correctly, Node.js and TypeScript. Um, but like most applications I build are in, in Python with that. So you need both Node and Python support to build it correctly. Um, so you could just like list all of the runtimes you want down here. And that comes by default in this like standard 2.0 code build. If you had some other requirements, maybe for regulatory reasons, you can only use specific images for building your code um, for like security concerns. Then you could just say, use like that image and you could point this to ECR, the Elastic Container Registry or ECS Container Registry, I believe it's called. And it will pull in one of those images instead. Um, so this is just telling what build, what image to use, and I'm saying just use the standard one. Privileged mode allows me to build Docker containers inside of Docker containers, like a Docker reception, um, which is what I do down here. Um, there's, if you're using SAM build and telling it to use a container, this privileged mode has to be true. But if you're not doing something where you need to like, you need essentially root permissions on the image, then you don't necessarily need privileged mode. And you might have a security. Uh, guideline saying don't use privilege mode for whatever reason. Maybe you're pulling in third-party libraries or something, you don't want that. And then we can pass in environment variables. So we could say, same way on your uh, local build server, you might create environment variables and say, you know, this is the director, this is home dir, this is uh, like my AWS credentials or some other values. We don't have to pass in AWS credentials here because they, it just gets them from the standard build image. Um, but these are just passed in. This is a bucket we created earlier. And then we tell the source was from the pipeline. And then this is where like all of the magic happens in the build spec. So the build spec uh, is fairly well defined. I don't think it's an Amazon specific thing, um, but this has like several steps in the phases where there's install and build are the only ones I'm using, but there's like pre-build, post-build, um, post-install, I think. There's about five or six stages. That, um, so you can break up your uh, build process into several like logical stages. Like you want to do all of your install stuff together. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that commands that are run at like in one of these phases are executed in like their own shell that it'll exit out of that shell and start a new one. So aliasing doesn't work across stages, but like exports do. So if you're exporting a variable, um, you know, in bash, then you can use it in another thing. But if you're just doing an alias, the alias is blown away. It's one of these weird like edge cases that you wouldn't think would be an edge case until it bites you, and then you're like, why? Why would they do that? It's, um, and then I just do this like ls command just to like show that it's running to help me like debug it. And then this is the stuff that I need to um, build and test and package up my application. This would vary depending on what your application is. Um, so I'm installing the AWS SAM CLI, some testing inf infrastructure. I am setting an alias. Not actually an alias. I'm like assigning a variable to this. So yeah, the base path, exporting it. And then here I'm running my tests. And then assuming that passes, I build it. 
Um, and then I do AWS CloudFormation package, which packages it up and puts it in our like external S3 bucket, um, which is just the the resources, the actual um, like zipped up files, which constitutes my actual Lambda function, is what's put into that S3 bucket. And then um, what the build step actually outputs is just like the template itself. So the template has a pointer to that bucket, um, but we actually just to keep like minimize the number of like files flowing around inside of the pipeline, uh, we manually move those to the S3 bucket ourselves. And then you can say a, a timeout. With code build, your build for the instance size multiplied by the number of minutes that use it, and I think at like a either one second or a one minute in increment. Uh, and if for whatever reason you have a, a step that says to wait for something, you don't want it to wait like for six or seven years, right? Because you'll just be paying for the instance that whole time. So you can put a timeout and they'll just fail and say the build failed um, just to you know protect your wallet. If you work for a big company, you don't have to worry about that maybe. I don't know. Um, I personally worry about it. That's why I keep it down at like 10 minutes. So I'm going to paste this in here. Oh. As usual, I didn't, I'm so used to using PyCharm that I forget to save things. I know that the, the uh, JetBrains IDE automatically saves when you context away. So it was like, oh, there's no nothing to deploy. Um, so my last change. Uh, Cool. This is a problem that we would expect. If you create any kind of IAM role or policy, you have to tell it, I'm creating an IAM policy. I'm creating something that has permission to do things, and you have to be very explicit that you're allowing that to happen as like a security, like a guardrail. Um, so you just add this, this flag that says capabilities. I never get this to work on the first try, but we'll see. Where's my mouse? So I can misspell capabilities or I misspell the all caps version. And we're saying, yes, I'm giving this permission template. This, I'm giving this template permission to create IAM resources. And this, should, you know, this will take a minute because it's creating a few resources. We'll go back to the workshop. It's going, all right, there. So now we have a code commit repository and a build project but they're not connected in any way. They both just kind of like exist in the ether and they're like floating around. We're gonna use a pipeline, which is what's gonna tie them all together. So if we go back to our diagram, right, there's a code build and the code commit, right? The, we need the pipeline to tie them together. So let's make this pipeline. Actually, before I copy and paste this in, I'm not gonna go over the pipeline role again. It's similar to the code build role. Uh, so it's you know, assume role by code pipeline. The policy, we give it, uh, um, we have to give it some like fairly like quite a few CloudFormation privileges because it needs to deploy CloudFormation stacks to other account to this account or to other accounts. Some people might do something like this. Um, you should yell at them, but don't yell at me when I do this. Um, that it's you know this took me like three hours to figure out like all of these permi individual permissions it needs, but this is true least privilege. This is only the permissions it needs to do its job and nothing more. This like it could in some way like delete the code commit repository which there goes all my version control, like everything's just gone. Um, so this is why you don't, you shouldn't do things like these. Some people describe these asterisks as a, a, you know, like a spider just waiting to bite you. Um, this is more of what you should be aiming for. It's an example of like do as I say, not like how you see me do. Um, and the rest of these are like code build, start build, and get builds that kind of make sense. You need the pipeline to be able to start a build. Uh, passing the role, we'll, we'll get to in a moment. Uh, well, we'll get to right here, actually. Yep. So uh, there's a role that we use for code build. So code build uses this role to do the building stuff. There's a role that pipeline use, uses to interact with code commit, interact with code build, interact with CloudFormation. And then there's a separate role that CloudFormation uses to actually execute a, a, a change set. Now, some people might say, like, oh, like the mega role, and they give it all the permissions, and it just does all of my DevOps stuff. Um, but that means like your CloudFormation stack could like clobber something else because it has permissions to because it has no way of knowing that it's in like being used in the cloud in the CloudFormation context and not in the code pipeline context. So even though it's it is a bit difficult and it seems tedious, um, I would separate these um, these roles out into separate roles, and especially this CloudFormation deployer role because it essentially needs administrator access in order to run because you want to be able to give your developers the ability to like deploy any resource they need. And they might create an API gateway one day, but tomorrow they might create a Lambda. The next day they might create a DynamoDB instance. After that, they might create EC2 instances. Um, that 
you have no way of predicting that. And if you had just said, okay, you have full control for Lambda and API Gateway, because that was, was your architecture diagram, and then they tried to add some other feature, the deployment would fail, and then you have to go in and change this. So this is a very powerful rule, and it's something that you wanna make sure that only CloudFormation can assume it, and it's like locked down in terms of like what people can do with this role. Essentially, people shouldn't be doing anything with this, it should be just CloudFormation doing this when it deploys. I know I spent a lot, it was kind of a detour, but that's very important. That like, administrator access could, if those credentials get leaked, like it could be very painful. There's no way to like understate that, that is very bad. And the actual, I'm gonna copy this real quick and then we'll get into the pipeline. My legs are getting stiff, so I'm gonna try and talk faster so we can go get something to drink. Let me check on this. Yep, okay, that was successful. Okay, so now is the actual pipeline itself. Uh, pipeline policy, why did I do that? All oh, right. Um, this is like a depends on statement here. Um, that just says, uh, as we're going through this, it makes sense that this would be created afterwards, but when it's all in one big CloudFormation template, CloudFormation doesn't enforce that things be done like in order. You could have all of like the things you need built first, like at the very bottom, um, and then like all the things that it depends on, like above it, um, because it'll like create the dependency graph and figure out kind of what depends on what uh, based on your references. And it's possible that in this specific context, we say like use this role but as we saw earlier, we created a role and then we assigned it, we created a policy and we assigned that policy to the role. But um, we also say that this pipeline is implicitly depending on the role as well. And what could happen is you get a race condition where the pipeline, the role finishes and then the pipeline tries building before the policy finishes building and is attached to it and then it fails. And it's uh, no idea what happened. You click retry and then it works. It's usually like you'll click retry and it'll fail and then you'll ask someone to help you and then they click retry and it passes. And then like, this person doesn't know what they're doing. They don't know how to click a mess. It's always the way it works. Um, yeah, see, so yeah, this is where I just commented out where I named something. So yeah, commenting out code and then leaving it in there, that's also a great practice that you should not copy from me. And then the, so we say like, this is where like the artifacts are stored that you're gonna use for like, after each stage when it emits artifacts, put them in this artifact store. And when you're starting a new stage, give that stage artifacts from this store. So it's like the central repository for this. Um, and then this is the fun part. So these are all of the stages of the build which correspond to here. We've got a build. There's technically a source stage which is kind of like if this thing here, see if I make this big, there it is. If that um, were technically down here, it would be more accurate, like the three stages. So there's the source stage which is code commit with this name and then the branch if you want, if some people use develop is a common term people use, like the branch that they always use, and then very rarely they'll manually merge stuff into master or mainline. Um, you can pick whatever branch you want. Um, as we'll see in a moment, they'll actually fail because when you create a new repository, there is no master branch, so it's like, I don't know what's going on. The first time it'll fail, that's okay. And this is just the name for the artifacts to use when it pulls it from this source, which you can name it whatever you want. And then what role to use for this. So you can say that the pipeline itself has a role, which is up here, and then you can also individually say that um, for this stage, use this specific role. In this context, it doesn't make much sense that they would be different, right, or that I even specify it, because I'm saying the pipeline needs to do this, and then in this stage, you know, okay, the pipeline can do this. This helps when you're trying to deploy things across many accounts, because the pipeline needs to assume a role in the other account in order to deploy to that account. So what I want the pipeline to do is when it's doing things locally in its own account, like code build or fetching the source, uh, use its own role. And then when it's um, deploying out to other accounts, use those other roles. So it gives you the granularity, but you don't necessarily need them. I could strip all of these out if I was just doing it in one account and it would still work. And then the build step, which will reference the build project that we created. And for these, you give them a run order. So inside of a stage, which we'll see like graphically in just a moment, you can specify run orders inside that stage. So you can say all of these things need to run um, and they're not dependent on one another um, like explicitly, uh, but like, I want them in this specific order. So this is where I'll have one CloudFormation stack that'll, uh, actually we'll see it with the change sets, but uh, you'll wanna like export something from one stack and import it from another. Uh, you wanna use the run order to make sure that this one finishes before the next one starts. And then the next stage is uh, we're gonna call it deploy to test. We're just deploy it locally, like inside the, like that account. And this is where we create a change set. 
it's called change set replace, but actually this one just creates the change set. So it takes the confirmation template, uh, does kind of like a dry run deploy almost, and says, okay, here's your diff, um, and then just stops there. And then in the next step, we have deploy change set, which is change set execute, where it says, yep, like that was fine. Um, I put these both inside the same um, uh, stage on here. If you wanted to make that like a manual process, which I'll also show in the console in just a moment, um, in between these two is where you would add, you just say, okay, this is now a new stage, not just a new part of the same stage, um, where you'd add a manual approval process. So the good news is once we paste this in, we'll be done with me talking about pipelines and we can see how it actually works. Oh wait. Oh, I didn't save that one. That'll be fine. So we'll give this a moment, we'll hop into the console just to see what's created so far. warm up here with all these lights. It's update complete. Oh, uh. So this is another thing you'll see is that it'll say update complete because the console hasn't updated, but this is still saying it's waiting to be updated. You're not really sure who to trust. My recommendation is don't trust either one of them and just give it another five minutes. Because sometimes you'll trust one and it's the other one's right. And sometimes you trust the other one and the first one's right. Um, so we will. Services, we want the code pipeline. We'll see if this creates. So this is what we're creating in this change set that we're deploying. So this gets like a little bit meta, right? Because we're, we have a CloudFormation template that we're using that's creating our entire CI CD pipeline. Uh, but like that template isn't controlled via its own CI CD pipeline. So it's just me running a command on my desktop. So somebody says, well, why not just like make a pipeline for that? So then you make a pipeline for that, but then the thing that makes that pipeline doesn't have a, a pipeline of itself and it's just pipelines all the way down. So at some point, someone has to do something manually unless you get into some weird like meta like inference or something to figure out how to do that. Um, I just say, okay, I'm gonna deploy the first one myself and I keep that checked in in the, like a central repository. So this is gonna take just a couple more minutes. Are there any questions while we're waiting for this? Any questions at all? Like my favorite Pokemon or anything? It's Charmander if anyone's wondering. <laughs> yeah, you have a question. Oh, like my URL for the thing? Yeah, so it's, um, it, it is GitHub, RH Boyd, like Richard Henry Boyd, um, that's me. Um, and then DevOps Days Boston uh, with the proper nouns capitalized. Or just D O D B, because they're not actually proper nouns. Uh, CloudFormation is notoriously slow. CloudFormation with CloudFront is even slower, so that's why I didn't have it. Yes, you had a question. CloudFormation deployment role. Yes, uh, his question is, we gave the CloudFormation deployment role administrator access, um, which lets it just do whatever. So if he uh, didn't get the performance review he was expecting this year and created a malicious CloudFormation template that created a bunch of EC2 like P instances to mine Bitcoins or something, uh, it would totally work. Uh, so if you're, if you've drank enough of the serverless Kool-Aid, you could like put like deny EC2 star policy on there too. And because you have an explicit deny, it'll not let someone do something like that. That gets tricky because technically Lambda needs EC2 create ENI permission if it's inside of VPC. Um, so it's not that cut and dry, just like all of the IAM stuff. Um, if you know, like, if you have a good idea of like how you expect your developers to write applications, you can scope that permission down. I just give it an administrator access for this demo just to make it easier. Um, I do it also, I do it at work, right, because I trust myself, right, and like the people I work with. And in order for it to do that, it has to get into the pipeline, which means they have to be able to 
um, like commit to the repository. We use like a code review system, so they'd have to get it past like another person. So they need like at least one co-conspirator. So if someone else had bad review too, like ask them. <laughs> yes. Yes and no. They have a GUI uh, interface. His question was, do, is there like a GUI or a console uh, experience to build all of this and then you can export the template? Uh, AWS doesn't offer that natively today. There is um, a guy named Ian McKay. I'll open up my Twitter and be totally professional. Um, someone made a thing uh, that's very specific, right? This might take a minute. So his Twitter name is Ian0036, which sounds like a Russian troll bot, um, but he's actually very nice. He made this thing called the um, console recorder um, that you click around the console and you make all this stuff and then it will tell you, I, I believe it, it does actually emit the CloudFormation template and it gets most of the way there. Then you get all the fun stuff of like cleaning up the sharp edges around that. Uh, but yeah, that's, AWS doesn't make that, but it is a thing that does exist. Um, I found it's easier just to copy and paste what someone else, like someone shows like an architecture diagram like, like this and say, here's my CloudFormation and I just copy their CloudFormation. Mostly because I don't trust people recording my console actions. Oh, cool, so the pipeline's here. It failed, which we expected because there's no branch master. So now we're just gonna create our like simple application and this will be like very quick and it's not necessarily related to like the actual like pipeline stuff. So if you're here just for the pipelines, you can leave. If you wanna see it actually work, you can stay. Um, and that's why we're gonna go over the blue screen. So we're gonna do SAM init runtime seven name. What are we gonna name this? Uh, malicious app. Um, so now this is just like an app that exists locally. We need to like put it into that code commit repo sometime, somehow. So I do git init, which initializes this as an empty repo. I keep losing my mouse. I've made this like so big that I like lose my mouse in the middle of it and I don't know where I'm at. You guys probably don't care about that. So this is an empty repository that we just created. Um, there's probably people who use Git enough to know how to do all these things without having to like check all of this stuff. Um, I'll show you what I mean by that in one second. So I'm gonna do Git remote add origin and then the URL that worked. Anyone else do this where you like, you, every time you run a git command, you do like git status afterwards to see if it worked? Like every command. I've done it millions of times, I'm still gonna, yeah, okay, so I do the same thing. Git commit, obligatory, you need like a very detailed commit message first. Uh, git push, this is gonna fail, but I like it because it tells me like what I'm, like the, the keynote, right? Uh, when you talk about, I did git push, but that command didn't work. So normally other services, they just say, oh, it didn't work. Like go to Stack Overflow and leave me alone. But this says like, you probably meant this. And I was like, that is exactly what I meant, thank you. And then that will push it to my repo, maybe. Cool. Um, so this we expected uh, because I'm using like an IAM user. So what I need to do is, this isn't being live streamed, right? I don't care if you guys see these because you won't be able to copy it fast enough to do anything with them. I'm gonna delete them after the thing. I, I made them this morning. Hey, put your camera down. <laughs> you people. Password. And like the resolution's so small, you guys probably can't see it. You all can't see it anyways. No, um, in AWS, I didn't create it. I, I'll show you. Um, so this is gonna start the, his question was, was that a username and password that I created in AWS? It was a IAM user I created, but AWS created the username and password for it, and I'll show you how to do that in just one moment. Uh, we're just gonna make sure that this works. The build process is gonna take about 10 minutes or so, um, so I'll show how to do that, um, like what I did kind of in the background. The internet's a bit slow, so we will, in parallel, check on both of these, pipeline. Very slow. Okay, 
before we leave it. Oh no, what'd that do? Oh, cool. So it, it was able to pick it up, right? So it, it saw that it was on the master, which was like the default branch, and then it's doing the build process now. We'll let this run because it takes a while to set it up the first time. Um, but I will go into IAM. And I'm gonna go over an example of like, when I said like the prerequisites for the workshop, you need to create an IAM user with these Git credentials. All the way up here at the top. I'm just gonna real quick like walk through like how that's done. Um, if you're doing this like at work, um, you probably wouldn't do something like this. Your company probably has like a policy. Maybe you're the person who gets to create the policy for like how this stuff is done. Um, if you are that person, don't make your whole company do this. Come see me and I can tell you examples of like how to do this in production for real. If you're doing this as a hobby, this is like the easiest way to do it. What I'm about to show you is the easiest way to do it. So you create a user. You could create the user in CloudFormation if you wanted to and like some of your base stacks. Add user. My malicious user. I don't know why it's still saying it's required. Programmatic access. This is strange. That shouldn't happen. Maybe you can't name it malicious user. I don't know. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. I was in the, um, the AWS forums a few weeks ago, and like you know, Google just created like the .dev domain names. So obviously I got one because everyone who's cool gets one. Um, somebody got like the Richard one, like when you know they did like the pricing, where it was like a thousand dollars and then twelve hundred, you know five hundred. And I, I waited for it to get like really cheap and then I bought it. But then somebody who was willing to spend more got my name. Um, but I use the .dev and I have that and I use that for my email. I'm in the forums and I use like rboy.dev, um, like Richard at rboy.dev, and it's like that's not a valid email. Like it doesn't work. I was like, I get, I get mail, like I have an AWS account made with that account, like it should totally work. But then I did like totally not Werner Vogels at amazon.com and it did work. So their like naming preferences are uh, hit and miss, I guess. Um, you wanna attach a policy is code commit, full access. I think power user might work too, but let's say fun. Create user. Normally you'd add tags like finance and like tracking and stuff like that, but just for a demo we don't need to do any of that. Let's check on our pipeline. This will probably have failed for some random reason. Oh, it's still running. So these are like the regular like access key secret keys, which we're not gonna do anything with right now. Um, normally you you need those to do like programmatic access. Uh, for this, you go into security credentials, and at the bottom, generate git credentials, and then it'll create this username and the password. And hide that. You, know, I mean, you can see it. Doesn't. Worst case, someone like pushes something to this repo during the demo and it breaks, and then I'm very upset with you. You've disappointed me a lot. So this is what I copy and paste in there, but I just did like the download credentials and then close this. And that's the IAM user that I use for this demo if you wanted to reproduce that. Oh, it succeeded, All right? So we see like, this is like the build output you'd normally expect. This was that like ls command. So it'll tell you in code build, it'll say this is the command that I ran that you had listed and then the output. All right. um, so yeah, we see pre-build, build, build um, edit pip install, which is fairly long. I'm sorry if I'm making you nauseous by scrolling really fast. Um, these are like the things in blue are the rest of the commands that I ran. I, I ran like a test, it passed, because the test that came with it just asserts that it, the default template works. Uh, use container to do the build. We uploaded it and let's go back to our pipeline. Oh no, someone disabled this. Oh no, wait, it's just. So weird thing of like the when the internet's slow, it doesn't update as quickly. So here's where it created a change set and that succeeded. And now it's deploying the change set, which we can open this up. So this is the part I was talking about where you would create a new stage, right? Like each of these big blue blocks here is like a stage and you would separate these into separate stages with like a manual approval step in the middle. If you wanted to say, okay, your CloudFormation template can deploy to here and it essentially does like a dry run of a deploy and then a person has to go in and manually approve it. So this might uh, prevent your malicious attacker scenario 
um, where you know maybe someone from security or ops has to approve it, so you need like a third co-conspirator to help you get this through. Pipeline, my app, this is update complete. So this is actually done, but it still is spinning. Um, and this is our actual application. Because I'm zoomed in so far, it's a bit hard to read. But we have the API gateway. So the application I said, like the initial template that we created is just like a Lambda function and API gateway. And here it is that it's been created, and then we can just test it. It should just say hello world. Maybe it's really fast, I swear. Yep, and it succeeded. 200 status, hello world. So now you can go into the, the blue window. You can make all your code changes that you would normally do in there, whatever your development cycle is, and then like git push, and then it'll just go through the pipeline and that'll deploy it. So then you've got like a full CI CD process from uh, every time someone does get push, it just automatically builds. So there's no more of this manually moving files around and stuff like that. And we're at like 440, which was uh, right where I said about an hour, hour and 10 minutes. Uh, so I'll keep you guys here all night. Does anyone have any other questions? I loved your suit yesterday. I think this one's also very good today too. But yeah, but, well, you might have a question, but I, I had a comment. Uh, someone over here started to raise their hand. You did, yes. Um, so the actual, like, when they check it in, it goes to that build process, that can be a bit slow, about 10 minutes or so, which is nine minutes and 58 seconds longer than a developer's attention span. Um, <laughs> there are tools for, um, like, developing locally, so you can, like, you can mock out most of this stuff. So if it was just, like, a Lambda function, API gateway, the um, serverless application model allows you to have, like, a, a local API gateway, and you can send stuff to it. So you only really, like, do, like, git push when you're ready for, like, a code review where you're just going to, push it to like a, a developer branch and then go home for the night or like, you know, create the, the, the code review to like submit it and then it would do the build as part of your um, code review process. Um, yeah, so that's something you, you could add in like the build step, right, if you wanted that, to just to ensure that they're in the build spec file that I had. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. I said I was done, and then he came over here, and I was like, just kidding, not done. Uh, and now he's mad at me. I won't be invited back next year. <laughs> um, so in like the, um, you would do that probably like right around like the build or like the pre-build stage, where you'd, you would have like a static code analysis thing done there. Um, what I described earlier, where on like mainline, there's like the build that happens, and then if someone uh, commits to like a feature branch, you can specify a different build spec to use. So you're not gonna do static analysis on every test build that you do. So you could have like your own like version of the build spec that you would use um, for your like rapid iteration process. And you can pull this container locally, like in the code build documentation, it shows you how to pull essentially like most of the code build service locally, and then you run that in Docker. So you would know that if it passes on your machine, unless it's an IAM permission issue, it'll most likely pass when it runs in code build. And that's real quick, that's like a Docker image on your machine. And just um, to repeat, his question was how do you I should have repeated it earlier, I apologize. How do you, um, this process is a bit slow to get through the entire pipeline, it takes about 10 minutes. The ones I use in production are about an hour to get from commit to, to prod. Um, you know, Developers aren't gonna wait an hour to see that something breaks. Um, and there's tools for local development that help that. This is more for like once they're, they've do, they're done with their local development, whatever that entails, and they're ready to push it. And then we can for, and, uh, ensure that everything has been done correctly. So we got one last question and then I gotta go. Yep, one last question. Yes. Can you repeat the question too? Yes. Uh, is there a framework for testing Lambda locally? There is, um, depending on your test strategy, you can do like there's um, SAM local invoke, um, which allows you to like test that you can specify an event object and then like pass that in as if it were um, coming from whatever the service was, maybe it's API Gateway or CloudWatch events, and then do some assertions on the output of that. Um, you can, because the Lambda is like written in Python, I use PyTest. Some people use um, Jest if it's like a Node.js thing and just test it they would any way another, any way they would test another um, JavaScript or Lambda application. Uh, so there's two other people who had questions. I can answer them off to the side afterwards. 
Cool. Thank you. Richard. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.